Thank you for tuning into our podcast, History's Top 3, brought to you by the History Department of the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. In this show, we will discuss and debate some of the key turning points, trends, and major figures of world history. Our goal is to explore the varied landscapes and seascapes of the past in the hope of shedding some light on how the present world came to be. In our studio today are our three co-hosts, Lieutenant Commander Chris Costello, Adjunct Professor Courtney Spikes, and myself, Lieutenant Mac Anderson. All of us are instructors and lifelong students of history. Today, we will be discussing the top three historically significant commodities. Each co-host will offer a few contenders for the list. And then, after everyone has had their say, we'll narrow this list down from six to three. All right, folks, let's hear your nominations, starting with Chris. Well, oil, gold, and silver are certainly consequential commodities, but are also well known. I offer the humble fish as my opening entry. Fish have been a primary animal protein source for humans for millennia, and in particular make up the bulk of animal protein consumption in developing nations. Accessible for people in both fresh and saltwater environments, and thus tied to human settlement areas dating back to 75,000 BCE, the history of fish as a global commodity connect us personally to the past and illustrate the ways in which control and access to fish have shaped our world culturally, politically, militarily, and environmentally. So broadly speaking, food from the sea is the largest consumable commodity in the world, and the broad commodification of fish occurred during the 17th century, although there was significant fisheries trade uh, evidenced all the way back to antiquity. The sale of tuna fish funded Hannibal's elephant campaign, and in 1588 it enabled the sailing of the Spanish Armada. Control of fishery resources, including river and ocean access, began with European monarchs in the Middle Ages, as did catch regulations to prevent overfishing. The advent of salted fish turned the animals into commodities capable of long-distance, stable transport, which allowed for economic growth of the market while simultaneously fueling transoceanic colonial endeavors beginning in the 16th century. The Industrial Revolution transformed the harvesting of fish into an exponentially environmentally destructive practice that increased the consumption of the commodity itself, fueling further global trade via mercantilism. During the 20th century, this practice of industrial and exploitative capitalism depleted whole stocks of fish globally, ending a practice begun two centuries prior in the West. Herring, Manhattan, cod, and certain tuna and salmonids were nearly wiped out, while sustained demand uh, for fish resulted in the targeting of new species and specious mislabeling in global markets. Artificially raising fish in farms to satisfy increasing demand, balanced resource management, but broach questions about ethical treatment and unintended environmental destruction. Global conflict over fishery commodification continues. China's immense and state-sponsored fishing fleets illegally harvest fish from other nations' exclusive economic zones. English fishing in Icelandic waters from the 14th to the 20th century provoked protest and attacks against each other's fleets, uh, both merchant and military. In fact, Iceland's resolve to protect their fish threatened NATO's cohesiveness and turned the dispute into a Cold War flashpoint. In the United States, access to historical fishing grounds served as the basis for a series of protests from the Nisqually people against the state of Washington for violating a treaty obligation. A subsequent Supreme Court review held that access to fish uh, remain unabrogated in line with an 1855 treaty, a victory both for indigenous rights and environmental protection. Fish remain a global commodity that is absolutely critical and offer an interpretive lens of interconnected and oftentimes oppositional human goals. It's also what's for dinner. Chris, I think that's great uh, because we don't often think of commodities as food. We think of nowadays money. We might think of precious metals, which I'll talk about here in a second. But the idea of consuming a commodity is an interesting uh, point. You brought it up briefly, but I wanted to know more about how China's economic market for fish intersects with its foreign policy that we hear so much about. Yeah, great question, Mac. So uh, the demand in China for, uh, for fish uh, you know, ties back again to the point that I was making about it, it being a, a primary protein source and one that's accessible. So the flashpoint here is not just in the South China Sea, which would be most familiar to listeners, uh, but this is actually becoming a growing pro problem throughout the Pacific itself. So uh, China uh, has, uh, you know, state-backed fishing companies that go out and they will trawl and harvest fish 
Uh, and this is backed up by their, their People's Liberation Army, their maritime militia. Um, and, and so it's, a, it's an economic pursuit, but it's backed up with, with you know, Coast Guard support and then, and then military support. So it's a full, it's a full state effort uh, to feed their people. Uh, but the problem with that is uh, they will oftentimes violate other countries' exclusive economic zones as a result of this. So this is most familiar to people uh, looking at, at say, uh, the Philippines. Um, in their economic zones and, and how uh, the, the debate over that and kind of uh, the artificial features that, that China has built up in the South China Sea to stake claims uh, to those natural resources in the area. However, um, because of overfishing and the depletion of fish stocks in that area, uh, China is now uh, going into the eastern Pacific with these very large fishing fleets and violating uh, EEZs of South American countries, too. Now, this isn't totally unique. Japan had been accused of this by the United States, uh, particularly with tuna fishing in the past. But the scale uh, of, of this Chinese activity is, is a bit unprecedented and obviously is, is concerned not just for the economics of countries, but for their political sovereignty, and then also from an environmental perspective as well. Um, it, it's challenging. Many countries have treaties that they have signed with other nations dealing uh, with the management of fish stocks. So the United States and, and Canada, uh, we have treaties dealing with salmon. Britain and Iceland, uh, Britain and France, you know, they'll, they'll have treaties to, to help manage this. Uh, but the, the, the problem recently with China uh, is their uh, disregard for it in many cases or uh, kind of turning a blind eye or saying, well, no, it's not possible. We're not doing that. Um, and it's, a, it's certainly a solution that, uh, that I don't have access to, but uh, I can at least highlight the problem. Wow, that that is really interesting. Thank you so much for illuminating so much of that for us. I'm I'm fascinated, and I wanted to ask a question. You know, not as a scholar, but as a consumer. You know, I wonder. Can, I don't know if you can talk about this or not, but like the idea that you know you're at a restaurant and you're buying fish or the supermarket, and there is the difference between farm raised and wild. How does that play into this role of it being a commodity, or or what you're seeing happen uh, internationally? Yeah, great question, Courtney. Farm raising fish was a, a great solution at dealing with the over harvesting of natural fish stocks. Uh, what happens is you, you raise fish in pens, they're genetically modified, you keep them separate, so it allows for a much more sustainable natural resource that can oftentimes come at the expense of kind of local rivers that they're getting the water from, you know, high runoffs from the, the excrement of fish if it's not treated, although you can turn it into fertilizer and whatnot. Uh, the bigger concern, though, for the farm-raised stuff is, uh, and this happens around the world, is um, these farm-raised fish that have these genetic modifications to them end up escaping and then breeding with wild fish stocks uh, to the point where, uh, you know, these kind of hybrid fish species end up having, you know, 40% different genetic code in them. Um, and so that will create, you know, new diseases that the fish are susceptible to. Uh, it also uh, makes them more susceptible to uh, diseases and, uh, and parasites like sea lice that uh, wild-born uh, fish were not susceptible to. So uh, again, it's always the, the issue of unintended consequences that happen. So in some ways, it's much more environmentally sustainable. Uh, but then the, the, the trade-off to that is, of course, the ethical questions about raising animals for slaughter, um, but those second and third order effects that are a little bit harder to, to grasp your head around. Uh, of course, you know, sitting down at a restaurant when you say, hey, I want to, you know, Perhaps not tilapia because that's uh, not really a gourmet fish, if you will. But if if you sit down and you know you're looking for a, a delectable white fish, uh, it can be speciously mislabeled, and that's a great way for uh, fishmongers to actually get around uh, having to harvest you know hard to acquire fish uh, and merely mislabeling it as something else and charging a much higher price. Wow. And you as the consumer. Um, you're going to miss out because unless you actually uh, take a DNA sample and send it off for <laughs> testing uh, or your palate is that refined, you're going to have a hard time figuring that out. Wow. Who knew? Now I know sea lice are a thing, so I guess I'm not going <laughs> swimming anymore. Yeah, enjoy your nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Mac, how about you give us your top commodity? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And, you know, while fish may seem like a really tempting and, of course, a delicious entry to our list, everyone knows that precious metals are truly the most important commodity. My entry today is silver, and I hope to show how it helped connect the East and the West together, ultimately to the great detriment of both. In the 16th century, the Ming Dynasty of China ditched the previously used paper currency in favor of a silver-based currency. As European nations began expanding trade routes, they found that the one commodity that China was always demanding was silver. 
This worked out particularly well for the Spanish, who took control of the silver mine at Potosi in modern-day Bolivia in 1545. Potosi was the most significant find for the Spanish, and over the course of the mid-16th to the 17th centuries, thousands of tons of silver flowed from Potosi to the coffers in Madrid. Throughout all of the Spanish possessions, 32 million pounds of silver and 360,000 pounds of gold were extracted from the New World and sent to Spain between 1503 and 1660. This wealth came, of course, at the cost of native lives. 70% of native laborers engaged in silver mining, largely due to the mercury that was used in the mining process. Given China's demand for silver, one would think that the discovery of so much silver in the New World would set the Spanish monarchy up for success indefinitely. However, this was not the case. The Habsburgs of Spain, instead of focusing on material wealth, instead turned their attention to political ambition. As we know, political ambition requires military might, and military might costs money. Other countries, merchants, and arms dealers were more than happy to take Spanish silver in return for their wares or their political support. These countries and merchants, in turn, traded that silver directly to China in exchange for the various luxury goods that were demanded at the time by European high society. China's demand for silver as the basis of its economy resulted, and this number to me is astounding, resulted in over 75% of New World silver being sold to China from 1500 to 1800. In this way, it was China that indirectly financed the ruinous wars that Europe found itself entwined in during that same period of time. For the first time in history, Europe had stumbled upon a commodity that was in high demand in other areas of the world. Possession of that commodity allowed countries to either accrue wealth or squander that wealth on military might. That military might, then, was turned against their neighbors in a vain attempt to establish hegemony in Western Europe. It is not an exaggeration to say that without Chinese demand for silver, the European wars of the 16th through the late 18th centuries would not have been nearly as large scale as they ultimately were. Soon, though, European nations began realizing just how unbalanced their trade had become with China. The British East India Company, for example, was quickly going bankrupt, and the company needed to find some way to reverse that flow of silver. Unfortunately for Britain, they didn't really have anything that China wanted. But in colonial India, Britain found an answer. Opium. Throughout the course of the 1830s, 3 million and 80,000 pounds of opium flowed into China, while 34 million ounces of silver flowed out. This then led to the first Opium War from 1839 to 1842, where the British fought for the ability to sell opium in China and fought to continue to try to extract that silver from China. After the war, Britain then burdened China with a series of unequal trade treaties. Unlike the war on drugs that is so popular today, silver started one of the first wars for drugs. Mac, those numbers were absolutely uh, staggering that you were identifying in terms of uh, the, the volume and the value of the silver. Uh, and certainly Spain's extraction of, of silver in the New World drove a lot of their activity and, and tied the commodity to other world uh, markets. And in fact, uh, some people argue that it's the singular item that really drove the beginning of globalization. But all that shipping of silver uh, must have made it a pretty lucrative target for pirates. Uh, was that uh, ever a, a concern uh, for Spain? Oh, it was one of the biggest concerns. This is uh, where we start to see uh, the, the rise of the golden age of piracy, of course, a, a bit later than when Spain first started extracting. But as that money starts to flow, as it starts to change hands, and it's being shipped you know, both from the New World to Europe and from Europe to China uh, and uh, everywhere else, right, across the world, you do see the rise in piracy. And those kind of trading galleons that would carry the precious metals and other valuable resources, those were a pirate's absolute dream. That was 
a, a perfect target because they often weren't as heavily defended as men of war, uh, but they had all of that value within them. And still to this day, uh, Spanish treasure galleons remain one of the most valuable uh, finds for any kind of deep sea diver or treasure hunters because there were more than a few that had sunk. And we can see from that just how much cargo, precious cargo, these ships were capable of carrying. All right, so Courtney, let's hear from you with your first entry. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mac. So I wanted to talk about coffee. Did you know that every day people drink over 2.25 billion, that's with a B, billion cups of coffee a day? Well, I add about 20 cups <laughs> to that per day, so I'm doing my part. And that coffee is considered one of the oldest traded commodities in the world. You know, by the 1830s, 2.5 million bags of beans were actually produced annually, and by mid-19th century, it had actually become a hotly traded global commodity. In the 21st century, the humble green, that is unroasted coffee bean, is now considered to be either the second most traded commodity, with only crude oil surpassing it, or it's the seventh largest legal export worth over $102 billion in 2019, and estimated to increase to $155 billion by 2026. So coffee is primarily grown in tropical and subtropical climates. And the coffee plant produces a cherry whose seeds, what we would call beans, are then roasted to make coffee. And the business of coffee employs millions of people globally and has become an important industry to many developing nations, which combined together produce about 90% of all coffee. Some actually estimate that there are over 20 million families involved with coffee production worldwide. But, you know, where did it all begin? So according to legend, whether or not you believe this, around the 9th century, get this, an Abyssinian goat herder named Caldi found his goats prancing after noshing on the berries of a suspicious plant nearby. Apparently, Caldi tried some of the red berries himself, and he joined in the lively dancing. The right? things that my grandmother always warned me not to do. <laughs> Try a strange Ooh. berry when you're out herding the goats. <laughs> but not long after, a monk met Caldi, and he took some of these berries to help him stay awake during prayers. I'm sure some of my midshipmen use coffee on a regular basis to stay awake during homework, which worked. And the monk started to dry and boil the seeds to make them into this new peppy beverage for the whole monastery. Later, around the year 1000, a famous Muslim physician philosopher proclaimed that coffee, quote, fortifies, clears the skin, dries up the humidities, and gives an excellent aroma to the body. And by 1453, Ottomans in Constantinople were adding spices like cloves, cinnamon, and star anise. Sounds very similar to our pumpkin spice lattes of today. And, you know, what I think is important to recognize about how the act of drinking coffee also had an effect on history. With the rise of coffee shops or cafes, men from all walks of life, from different social classes, would actually now find themselves thrown together, interacting and engaging in conversation that typically would have been unavailable to them in all other aspects of their daily lives. These new coffee houses were springing up, and in fact, in London by 1660, it would have 300 coffee shops in the capital city alone. And these would become places where people would exchange news and information and where culture intersected. Coffee would stimulate the conversation and even promoted some radical thinking. And in fact, our very own President Jefferson was the first to bring coffee to the White House. Currently, the largest producer of coffee is Brazil, with over 2.5 million metric tons per year. And that's about one third of all global production. And because of its unique nature, coffee remains labor intensive and some estimate over 5 million people are employed to hand cultivate and harvest the plants. The largest importers of coffee are not surprising. Europe is still the largest market with about 34% of it. Asia comes in second with Latin America and North America coming in third. And if you can believe it, Americans drink about 400 million cups of coffee per day, with the average American coffee drinker, notwithstanding Mac, consuming about three cups daily. Weak. <laughs> and do you know which state claims to have the coffee crown? Pennsylvania. Well, good guess. Chris? California. It's actually New York. 
New York claims the coffee crown and is the highest ranked coffee drinking state in the union. To be expected, Starbucks coffee chain is the largest in the world with over 30,000 location and a reported net income of over $800 million. Get this? just in the fourth quarter of 2019. So we're paying a lot of extra money at Starbucks for a little cup of brew. That's that's impressive. And, it, you know, part of this makes me sentimental and a bit a bit sad to hear you talk about the, the power and the impact of these coffee shops as they start to develop and they become centers of conversation and philosophy and uh, intermingling of all walks of life. Today you walk into a Starbucks, they call me old-fashioned, but... You walk into a Starbucks and everybody's got their AirPods on. <laughs> Is that what they're called, AirPods? Yeah, 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 yeah. They got their AirPods on, right. just focusing by themselves. Yes. I, I think the commercialization, industrialization of the coffee shop mm. has become a much more individualistic space Absolutely. than a community space. Uh, but besides for my old man ramblings, <laughs> um, I, I do have a question. Yes. So and I know you've heard of this article, but E.P. Thompson, a famous British socialist historian, wrote a really interesting, albeit maybe one of the dense, densest articles I've ever read, article in 1967 titled Time, Work Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism. In this article, he talks about the impact of a different caffeinated drink on the British labor force. Now, of course, he talks about tea, but I was curious if you had found anything that talks about coffee's impact Absolutely. on the labor force. That's a great question, and, and as a tea drinker myself, I can appreciate what uh, E.P. Thompson was talking about. As I mentioned before, Brazil is the largest producer of coffee. It also has very questionable labor practices. And in fact, some estimates put Brazil's uh, labor rate for children working in the coffee industry at 37 percent. Honduras is estimated to be at 40 percent. And they use, especially in Brazil, this plantation labor concept where most people are in debt and they're coming to work it off uh, as part of their plantation worker. And I think, you know, many people use the phrase that it feels like enslavement. And in fact, in 2016, Nestle, who's one of two of the largest um, uh, purchasers of coffee, acknowledged slave labor by saying it actually could not guarantee that the coffee it's purchasing did not come with forced labor practices wow. or illegal use of labor in the collection of the coffee. So that's why I follow Hydro Homies. It's a subreddit that's all about drinking water. And they they are kind of yeah, leading yeah. the charge of the boycott against Nestle. I didn't realize, having not looked into it, kind of this connection with, with slave labor there. Wow. Absolutely. And for them to come out so publicly about it, I think, is astonishing to me. Like, why not purchase their coffee elsewhere or demand that labor practices change? And, in fact, hundreds of slaves are rescued from Brazil plantations each year. It's uh, quite distressing to hear and actually makes me feel pretty bad about my own coffee consumption because <laughs> right, I, I right. don't think that uh, when I buy my bags of coffee that I'm looking for uh, for fair trade on the bag necessarily. It's mostly based upon taste. And if you uh, notice, Starbucks has a lot of advertising about the fact that it's using fair trade coffee. And that's really uh, focused on that in terms of its um, delineation from companies like Nestle. A good marketing shtick for them, I am sure. Uh, so when, when I'm in the grocery store then, and I'm, I'm staring at the hundreds and hundreds of different types of coffee that are available, uh, one of the, the genres I often see um, is that the composition in the bag are Arabica beans. Now, I, I know Kaldi was, of course, from the Arabian Peninsula when he came across um, coffee beans for the first time and decided to, to risk ingesting them uh, after his goats had. But... Um, it, they were not on your list of, of the largest producers of, of coffee beans anywhere globally in the world anymore. Were they ever a significant producer, or, or it, were they never a significant producer, or have they just been overshadowed since then? Uh, well, what's going on there? Is it maybe just like a, an amalgamation of, uh, of different types of beans, and they slap a label onto it to make it sound good? Uh, that's a great question. You know, it's interesting. It has been overshadowed. Um, you know, in Africa, Ethiopia is definitely the largest producer of coffee, but all African countries combined producing coffee are still only 12% of the total market. 
But you bring up a good point about, you know, the difference between the Arabica bean uh, versus the Robusta bean, which is sort of what you're talking about, and the Arabica bean, which again is in smaller quantities in terms of its production, is actually more highly valued. It's supposed to have a more uh, sweeter, smoother taste. It's supposed to have some fruity undertones. I mean, they talk about almost like a wine, in fact, um, and it has a higher acidity, which is supposed to be something that's very important and part of the uh, experience there. So it's um, considered uh, more, that's why it's probably costing more for you in the supermarket. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess I guess coffee beans like uh, like grapes that go into wines, where they're grown and the the environment that they're grown in has a profound impact on the on the flavor characteristics of it. Absolutely. So maybe just a marketing ploy, but uh, maybe also an element of truth to that. Fantastic. All right, I guess I'll go to the grocery store on the way home today. So, Chris. You know, coffee is considered one of the legal commodities. I'm curious about your recommendation for one of the top three commodities. Yeah, so this is this is my second argument, but it's actually it's actually the most important one. So the most important global commodity in history is is obviously drugs, and not just any drugs, but illegal drugs. <laughs> uh, I put it at number two on my list because I'm a government employee, and I don't want to be subjected to unnecessary urinalysis if it seems like I'm cheerleading it. Now <laughs> we'll, see, want, we'll see what happens tomorrow morning. Yeah, when the yeah. When that, when that list it comes depends up. on how good that coffee is. Yeah, I, I, I want to be clear, right? I'm making a historical argument. This is what historians do here. So uh, to that end, I'm arguing about illegal kind of recreational drugs. So stimulants, depressants, uh, excluding alcohol, opioids, hallucinogens, and narcotics. In other words, uh, kind of the substances used by people to feel differently and generally prohibited by governments. Uh, the illegal trafficking of drugs is a $400 billion enterprise uh, supported by over 215 million um, <coughs> customers globally. And it's chased <laughs> by $100 billion of government eradication efforts, usually in vain. Uh, the illegal drug trade crosses national borders and networks together legitimate and illegitimate businesses, governments, public health, and the environment, right? It, it's got it all. So historically, humans have used illegal drugs to escape the pain and monotony of the human condition itself. Uh, drug usage began tens of thousands of years ago for religious ceremonies, medicinal reasons, and then recreational usage. And organized efforts to oppose its usage first began through religious organizations and then shifted to state governments. Uh, because this is a podcast about the commodification of drugs, it's worth pointing out that profit of recreational drugs was substantial both while legal and then after prohibition through the black market. Uh, and what's fascinating is the global kind of interconnected nature uh, of the illegal drug trafficking market, uh, tying in opium and coca supply chains in Asia and Latin America through transoceanic routes to reach user users of every nationality. Uh, it's estimated that 1% uh, of all global trade is illegal drugs. Uh, now, interestingly, amphetamines were legal here in the United States in the 1920s and used to fight fatigue in soldiers and prescribed as an OTC inhalant. Uh, it was only after the FDA scheduled it that it became outlawed due to its increased potency. Similarly, uh, and I think many listeners are probably familiar or have kind of heard a wives' tale about this, but cocaine long enjoyed a legal market, I'm looking at you, Coca-Cola, until 1914. LSD, uh, discovered by accident in the 40s, saw widespread synthesis in the 60s and 70s, deeply influencing, along with marijuana, the American culture culture, despite being banned in 1966. And the CIA, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, they had to test it to see, uh, to see if they could get people to tell the truth, uh, amongst other things. Absolutely. Uh, marijuana was long legal in the United States until 1937 when it was outlawed but saw a surge in usage as an alternative to alcohol, which at that point uh, had been banned by the Volstead Act. Uh, however, of all drugs, opium has the most fascinating impact in history, as Mac identifies causing two wars uh, between the British and the Chinese empires in the 19th century, initiated by, well, you guessed it, Chinese attempts to outlaw it and to actually enforce that prohibition. Uh, so the British import of that Indian-produced opium into China uh, created profoundly negative economic and social upheaval. British import of Indian-produced opium into China created profoundly negative economic and social upheaval for the Qing dynasty, uh, who began then destroying stores of the drug in Canton and setting off a chain of events 
that drew the nations into war and ultimately saw Britain gain massive concessions from the Chinese, including indemnity and Hong Kong cession. Uh, and of course, the United States benefits from this as well. Uh, the U.S. negotiates kind of a reciprocal treaty to the British Treaty of Nanking, uh, where we do some jackal diplomacy and also get the benefit uh, without having to fight the war, uh, despite the fact that uh, many profitable American uh, producers were actually trading in opium too. Uh, so the uh, the British did the uh, did some American companies favors um, in the late 30s and into the early 40s there. Uh, so what lessons can be learned from this? Uh, well, for starters, prohibiting certain commodities always has unintended consequences. Uh, in this realm, it's it's pretty profound. So beyond the economic impact, the political, social, and, and public health consequences um, of illegal drug usage is is staggering. Uh, and, and for these second and third order effects, particularly with organized crime and the wanton violence to support that criminal activity, uh, that also contributes to political volatility to try to combat those organizations, which are all transnational. Um, and then having woeful political policy to enforce and stop trafficking. And then the, the ruinous health and social consequences on an individual, uh, family, community, and social level uh, for, for drug dependency. Uh, these are all factors that make me consider uh, illegal drugs as the most important and consequential commodity. That $100 billion spent on eradication efforts, is that just in the U.S.? Uh, no, that's that's a global number. Oh, okay, okay. Well, regardless, I'm sure whatever the U.S. is spending could uh, pay for a lot of ship maintenance and uh, you know other things that we really need to focus on. So that's interesting that that number is so high. And then second, I think we're facing a really interesting time with the amount of states who have legalized marijuana with a lot of talk among both parties in Congress about the legalization federally of marijuana. Uh, and yet we still see in, in states like Oregon where it may be legalized, there's still this kind of black market going on and the, the acceptance of, of fully legal marijuana for whatever reasons, be it higher prices, be it slightly higher barriers to entry, um, we see that there's still a black market component, which is interesting. California actually had anticipated a tremendous tax windfall from their legalization of marijuana a few years ago. And they ended up with something, and don't quote me on this, I'm, I'm just kind of recalling it from memory. They ended up with like a $150 million shortfall because they were expecting people to just give up their uh, you know, kind of uh, illegal suppliers and just go down to the local marijuana dispensary and be buying their drugs there instead. But what they didn't take into account was the problem of taxation and the black market still offered cheaper, although harder to acquire drugs. And so for, you know, people trying to, to live on the up and up and, and experiment with marijuana the, the, the legal way, um, you know, they would go in there and purchase it, but it did not have the uh, did not have the impact that the state was was looking for. And as you mentioned, it's because of those really prohibitive barriers in terms of making it really difficult uh, to get permits to do it, very high insurance costs, limiting the number of competitors. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, taxing it to hell and back. And, uh, you know, they could have looked at American history uh, to our opposition to certain tax policies uh, to, to figure out that they may not be getting the money they were expecting. All right. So continuing with the uh, the exploitative uh, <laughs> uh, theme of my entries. All commodities moving... seem to be illegal or exploitive. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I interesting theme there. Uh, we're moving now from silver to rubber. Rubber is a product that we couldn't imagine living without today. From tires to mechanical parts to sports gear, rubber is simply a staple in the modern economy. But much like silver wreaked havoc in China, European demand for rubber was devastating to colonized peoples, particularly in the infamous case of King Leopold II of Belgium and his little plaything, the Congo Free State. Interestingly, Belgium's involvement in the Congo began under the auspices of a charitable organization run, run personally by King Leopold, the so-called International Association of the Congo. During the Berlin Conference of the mid-1880s, Leopold was essentially given free reign over the land to run it through his charitable organization. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, natural rubber was in high demand. Synthetic rubber wasn't invented yet, and it wouldn't be invented until 1908, largely due to the increasing scarcity of natural rubber. Although rubber was extracted from various places throughout the globe, 
the Belgians oversaw rubber extraction in the Congo with particular brutality. In a stirring first-hand examination, Roger Caseman of Ireland helped break the news to the European public of the atrocities committed by Belgium in the name of rubber extraction. In one of Caseman's interviews of a native man forced to labor for Belgium, he said the following, quote, When it was not enough rubber, the white man would put some of us in lines, one behind the other, and would shoot through all our bodies. Sometimes he would shoot us like that with his own hand. Sometimes his soldiers would do it, end quote. Another native stated that, quote, many fled and some were mutilated. I saw myself a man who had had both his hands cut off. Sometimes they cut them at the wrist, sometimes farther up with a machete. It was sheer cruelty. The state treated us abominably. This rubber extraction helped fuel European industry in the lead up to World War I, providing much of the materials necessary for the weapons of war then under construction. Without a readily available source of rubber for Belgium, European nations would have had to import more expensive rubber from the Americas, thus driving up the already insanely expensive arms races then going on. While rubber may not have been as valuable as various precious metals, the rubber extracted by Belgium and the Congo cost heartily in terms of native blood, and it also helped to fuel the European arms race prior to World War I. What's so surprising to me, it's not just that Leopold had control over the Congo, but that it was his personal property, that he was owner of the land in his capacity as a ruler in Europe. It's just astonishing to me. And that he had to give it up in 1908, but there's a big gap between giving it up in 1908 and the Congo actually being free in 1960. I don't know if you have anything to share about that or can help illuminate any of that for us. It, it's, that's true. Uh, and once that land was given up, much of the land went to businesses, uh, to business owners. And these exploitative processes continued. And you can there are numerous studies that show even up until 1960, the people of the Congo engaging in labor for the... the Belgium were treated. Now, at this point, of course, they weren't getting their hands chopped off. They weren't getting uh, decapitated for not meeting production standards. But the quality of life, the standard of living that these men uh, could afford working as a laborer for Belgium was still the bottom of the barrel, right, until reaching independence. And, and even with that, we see the long-term consequences of a nation trying to forge itself from that legacy. Absolutely. And we see the problems that come from that, right? What do demagogues learn from? They learn from other demagogues. They learn from the brutality of those who came before. And so that was the only example the Congo had, yeah. was brutality. Uh, so some of the problems that we see are uh, direct reflections of the Belgian legacy. You know, it's interesting. When you were talking about that, it reminded me of something. I mean, it sounds like it went from private ownership of King Leopold II to enterprise business ownership, so that the experience might have been slightly altered, but basically the same for the people living in the Congo at the time. It kind of reminds me about what happened with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 91, where it didn't actually go all to the people. This is where we get the oligarchs that everyone is talking about with um, the issues with Ukraine and the sanctions that are happening uh, during Russians of Asia of it. Um, but the fact that the businesses and the government owned um, processes of enterprise were given over to these elite business owners who took control and made millions and millions and millions of dollars as a result. So oh, I, you I see it happen even in, you know, we're talking about it in the early 1900s. We're also talking about it in our own lifetimes. I was going to say, uh, speaking of oligarchs, how about tech oligarchs? Right. Is, uh, what what Courtney's nice. next commodity is that uh, <laughs> maybe is maybe is the, the least exploitative yet hard to understand out of all of our commodities, <laughs> but still environmentally destructive in a way, but perhaps not as bad. So what what do you have next? Oh, well, thank you so much. That's an awesome transition, Chris. Okay, so if you don't mind, 
I'd like to go back to Mac's first nomination of silver, which, you know, is something so ubiquitous and so universally understood as both a commodity and as a form of money that I thought it might be interesting for us to take a slightly different path, to look at the newest form of commodities that I know of, which are NFTs, or non-fungible tokens. So if we break down the traditional view of commodities, they typically have three attributes, right? Tradeability, deliverability, and liquidity. That is, they have a value attached to them that makes them able to be traded for something else that has attached value, or they're deliverable because they are a physical entity, or they have liquidity because they are well-established in the marketplace and are regularly bought and sold by other buyers, which speaks to everything we've talked about already in the podcast. But so where does that leave modern commodities like Bitcoin and non-fungible tokens? Well, to start with, let's define them. A non-fungible token, an NFT, is a non-interchangeable unit of data. And it's stored in what they call a uniquely identifiable blockchain. And this blockchain acts like a digital ledger of sorts. That digital ledger, that blockchain, can be sold and traded. Wait, hold up, Courtney. You're talking about blockchains. I thought we were talking about memes here. Isn't an <laughs> NFT just a, just a funny picture I can buy on the interwebs? Mm, close, close. There's some other uh, qualifications for it to qualify for that. So most NFTs are associated with digital files, like, like you were saying, Mac, a photo, a video, or even an audio file. Um, but they're also now increasingly connected to a digital representation of that physical object. Because each token is uniquely identifiable. NFTs are not mutually interchangeable, and thus they're not fungible. That's why they're non-fungible tokens. And in this way, NFTs differ from blockchain cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Bitcoin acts more like a traditional commodity in that each unit of Bitcoin is interchangeable like physical money. So when you have a $20 bill, I could swap your 20 Mac with mine, and we'll both have the same amount of money in our physical hands. This makes the $20 bill, or Bitcoin units, if I were to exchange them with Chris, fungible. Now, this differs from NFTs because non-fungible tokens are not interchangeable in the same way. And they are specifically connected to a particular digital asset. Plus, NFTs, and this speaks to your meme point, come with proof of ownership and authenticity. So let me give you an example. So artwork, not surprisingly, would be the first type of NFT to hit the marketplace. And first, they were actual digital pieces of art. But later, soon after, they became digital images representing a physical piece of art. The most notable NFT artwork was a piece of digital artwork by the artist Beeple, a.k.a. Mike Winkleman. When he created a specific piece of digital art that he then auctioned for sale, at a real brick and mortar auction house. Can you believe it? At Christie's in the spring of 2021. And Winkleman's NFT sold, forget this, $69 million. Nice. Making him, according to Christie's, quote, one of the top three most valuable living artists of today. And Winkleman's other NFTs are also earning money for their owners. So after this sale, other smaller, less valuable NFTs were being sold. So one of his early NFTs, uh, one of his early digital artworks, sold for $66,000, right? No big deal. After the $69 million sale, this person resold that original NFT for $6.6 million. So talk about an increase in profit. What's really interesting, too, is that Christie's Auction House allowed bidders to use cryptocurrency in addition to traditional bank accounts to bid for Winkleman's art. In addition to buying the NFT image, buyers receive a license to use that asset for a specific purpose. This makes the NFT potentially profitable to the owner because the implied value could spur trading and create a bidding war that in turn increases the perceived value of the NFT. However, some argue that the extra legal nature of NFT trading, I'm looking at you, Chris, ultimately results in an informal exchange of ownership, and it's difficult to apply traditional laws to protect those digital assets. So opponents to NFTs, of course, assert that NFT trading is little more than a Ponzi scheme because the NFT itself is actually just a blockchain of data rather than an actual item of value. So what do you guys think about NFTs? 
Uh, that's a loaded <laughs> question. Um, you, you brought up the example that the first NFT was an actual piece of digital art created by an artist. That I can understand. My Luddite brain can wrap <laughs> its, its arms around that idea. Because in the digital age, right, we have transitioned to a, a lot of things being online, on digital. I can imagine if Van Gogh was living today and he had access to Microsoft Paint, he could probably make some pretty valuable, <laughs> pretty valuable artwork. Right, right. So I can understand selling digital art. And the blockchain, in that case, uh, equates to basically the signature of the artist, much like we would see on a Van Gogh, which right, right. is what imposes its value, knowing it's authentic. What I do not understand is an NFT of an image of art that already exists or an NFT of a popular meme, say Will Smith at the Oscars. Yes. That, I, I cannot wrap my brain around how that holds value when, even though somebody may have the blockchain that says this is a legitimate NFT, I could go to Google, download the photo, put it on my desktop and say, I've got the same photo. Mm -hmm. So what is the value of NFTs in that instance? Exactly, exactly. And this is why people say it's a Ponzi scheme, right? Like where is the physical, where is the demonstrable value? And I would say, you know, I'm not arguing for or against NFTs. I just think they're fascinating. Um, I would say that perhaps if we look to the stock market, like what makes a stock more or less value? It's the trading around it. It's the perception of the value. And so you can create um, a lot of wealth out of nothing for a particular stock simply because there's a rush of trading around it and vice versa. We've seen a great example with that with, with GameStop, right? Right, right, the, right, the right. The right, boosting right. of this meme or me meme stock as they're calling it because Reddit users got really, really excited. What's really interesting to me though is that a lot of prominent personalities, sports figures, actors are now participating in this NFT business where they are taking images of themselves, creating a digital representation of that and allowing people to trade and make money from trading it or have ownership of the digital representation of the image of themselves. I certainly understand that point of view from from their perspective they can monetize themselves why would you why would you not want to do it you don't even have to believe in it you can think that the purchasers of this you know the dumbest people on planet earth so long as you're getting money like what, what do you what do you care i, I want to know you know on the on the purchasing side who is doing that and and what you know what their uh, what their expectations for purchasing and, and, and trading it are i mean it, it, it seems to me and i guess this is my question uh, are, are nfts just ahead of their time collectibles for our coming metaverse transition? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. But I do think it's interesting that, you know, there's a great example. Of, so William Shatner, he's an actor. He was Captain Kirk on Star Trek. Oldest he, man in space. Oldest man in space, right. And so he's sort of, you know, a known quantity. And he had basically a bunch of junk in his garage, like all these photos and uh, little artifacts, right? And he had a company come in and digitize them for himself. And then that company helped him sell the digitization of those artifacts um, on their particular platform, right, as NFTs. And I've got to tell you, he had about 125,000 digitized NFTs that sold in about nine minutes, netting him over $3 million. So he still holds on to those physical items. Correct. He has sold effectively a picture of junk in his garage. Yes. It is the greatest garage sale ever. Wow. <laughs> and what would prevent him from taking another picture of the same object and creating a second NFT out of that? This is the problem. Or selling the originals. Right. That's that's why he's the price line negotiator. <laughs> this, I don't know if, if I'm advanced enough to live in this world. I this think it's wild. a very interesting time, and I'll be curious to see what happens in five years, right? How, how much things are going to hold or not hold their value as, quote, blockchain data ledger entries in this traded, unseen, intangible world. I'm going to go home and make some NFTs, I guess. I want some coffee. Right. <laughs> I want the matrix. Fair trade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, we're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, we are going to discuss 
how we're going to cut down to our top three. Welcome back. So what we're going to start with now is a, a quick discussion about what makes a historically significant commodity, right? In my mind, there are two factors. First, it has to be historical, right? It, mm -hmm. it has to be involved in the past. We are all here at the Naval Academy History Department, so I want to choose something that's, that's based in the past. And the second thing I want to, to make my choice based on is the significance of the uh, producer or the harm on a user, right? The, the ways in which a commodity, which we think of having value, could actually create harm in a society. That's what I'm, I'm choosing to use mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. as, as my definition of significant. But what about you guys? Beyond the considerations for kind of the, the, the expanse of time, uh, you know, the pervasiveness of the commodities, one of the things that I thought about that, that led me to, to my own two, two choices um, was to be uh, impactful and significant in non-economic areas, right? You hear commodity, you just think economics. Um, and, and I wanted to find ones that uh, traversed into, uh, into other aspects of, of life. So uh, again, the, the, the environment, uh, politics, uh, public health, um, uh, food habits, uh, things like that are, are all kind of tied in. And so the, the, more, uh, the more realms of life, uh, if we're making a big Venn diagram of this, the more overlap that we're seeing, I think the more consequential the commodity is. And, and so that was primary for me. Yeah, I, for me too. I think all of those are great criteria. For me, it was really um, important to have it have um, international impact that it wasn't just specific to one country or one territory or one continent. Um, and so that's where I sort of went with uh, coffee and NFTs because they're both international. Great. So, Courtney, out of, our, out of our six, if you had to choose one besides your own, if you had to choose one to place on our list of the top three, what would you choose and why? I think immediately I would go with silver. I think oh, yeah. Because I silver, <laughs> because, because not only is it such an important player in, in – in the way you talked about it and its impact in China, but silver impacted many different nations uh, and international trade and um, how the developing economies really evolved into that next iteration in history. So I just think silver is a perfect example of that. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Chris? Easily coffee. Yay! Now, now admittedly, I, I have some bias here because I'm a frequent consumer of, of coffee. A I very, have a, very prissy um, uh, craft coffee, might not, I well, add. Well, it, I think there's, prissy's there's, a there's, there's rough word. I, I have an industrial coffee maker at my house that'll brew a full pot in about a minute and a half. And then I have the hand ground, you know, single origin coffee maker up in up in my office. So, uh, admittedly, I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit prejudiced to it. How have I not it. known about this? I could have been drinking coffee all year. Well, it, it's a very <clears throat> labor intensive process to ah. make it because <laughs> I, I hand grind the beans. Now, that's not to make light of of the poor people that are actually producing this worldwide. But uh, to that end, that's actually one of the reasons why I'm, I'm choosing it because. Mm. It, it is a commodity that is consumed, as you mentioned, internationally. Uh, people can relate to it, or, or kind of it's, you know, it's kissing cousin of, of tea, because uh, caffeine is great for human productivity. Uh, but the, the impacts of it in terms of uh, the extractive nature required to produce it, um, and then the impact that it has having on, on societies, on individuals, on families, uh, and then political efforts to try to mediate it. It meets all of that criteria that I was kind of looking for for its true, its true significance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, now, Mac, how about you? Yeah, this is a hard choice. Um, I love fish. I like fishing. I like to eat them, uh, <laughs> but although now I'm going to be really nervous about ordering fish in a restaurant, and what are you, you explain right? to Absolutely. us? You just, you just got to catch your own. Yep, that's <laughs> the only solution. But I think I've got to go with drugs uh, mm. because I think it's drugs that that meet my my own criteria. Obviously, they do historically. Yeah. Right. You cannot talk about the human condition without talking about intoxicants, whether they are legal or illegal. In this mm. case, we're talking illegal, and we can talk about harm, both of the producer and the user, 
right? Uh, in my own entry, we talk, or both you and I, Chris, talk about the opium wars. And you can talk at length about the war on drugs in the United States uh, and some of the harms that that may have caused, uh, in addition to the money wasted. Um, but uh, the, the interesting correlation and connection that humans have with drugs and the government's attempts to stop that via making them illegal, I think just makes for a fascinating process and an interesting look at the relationship between addiction or desire, not even necessarily addiction, but desire to use uh, something with the government, obviously, enforcing regulations against it. So for me, uh, drugs comes out on our top three. All right, folks. Well, at the end of the day, and after a fair amount of discussion and some hard consideration, it looks like we've come to our top three most historically significant commodities. Coffee, silver, and of course, drugs. And while there's plenty more to debate on this topic, we'll save that for a round of non-exploitative beers between friends. <laughs> we hope we've inspired you to learn more about some of these historical commodities and the ways in which the commodity markets work uh, for yourself. From all of us here at the Naval Academy, and particularly in the History Department, Thank you for tuning in to History's Top 3. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.